All right, if you take your Bible tonight, turn over to the book of Genesis and go to chapter 39, if you would. Genesis chapter 39. As you're turning over there, to give you a little update, you noticed probably as you came in that we've got a big pile of metal out on the lawn. And that is the building. That is the framework for the steel building. Um, of course, that's the, uh, you see one going up on the corner. It's very similar uh, as far as the construction type. And where we are right now, we are, of course, in the process of that, um, what we call surcharging. Uh, the, the orange dirt that you saw out there, part of it's still showing. That is the pad. That'll never change. That's the building pad. So what we're doing now is putting, for lack of a better term, junk dirt on top of that uh, for the weight. And that's the surcharge. It sits up there for, we don't know yet, hopefully a very short period of time. And we, we anticipate a short period of time. So in the meantime, we're doing everything else we can do. We're going to be fixing the septic field, uh, going through all of the engineering issues with the county and so forth as we're finishing that. Now, we uh, had to go down a little bit to put that pad in. And we didn't know exactly what that would entail, but there was about 120 loads of dirt on the pad, which at $270 a load, you can, you can do the math, that was 30 some thousand dollars worth of dirt. And that was the pad. Well, then you notice on top of that, there's another three feet of dirt. And dirt, the, where, where somebody came up with the term cheap is dirt. I'm not really sure where that came up, <laughs> came from. Um, but the most expensive part is the hauling. So it doesn't make any difference if you haul topsoil. That's a little more expensive than the junk dirt. Either way, it's got to be hauled. And so the majority of the cost is hauling it. So all of that dirt that we're not going to use on top of that, uh, we were anticipating putting about 100 more loads on top of that at $270 a load, and we couldn't even use the dirt. But it just so happens, I say in quotations, um, the Volvo plant is being built, and they're bringing dirt out of that, and they're dumping it in a pit down here, uh, which actually is a pit Butler Ware. You've heard that name before. He owns where our sign is. Um, we got in touch with him, and the contractor talked with him and found out one of the trucking companies, and they're willing to, instead of going all the way down there, they're going to dump the dirt right here for nothing. And so all I got to do is give them a little tax, you know, just to pay for a gift in kind. And so we're saving so probably 30, another 30-some thousand dollars off of that. So that, that's a great blessing. So hopefully uh, everything will continue to move. We'll try to keep you informed. Um, we've got some updated drawings. Uh, these were the initial drawings on the wall that uh, things have changed some, um, just as far as the way the building is set up. So I don't have as fancy as that, but I've got some that I'm going to put up on a computer for you, not tonight, but when we get them uh, together so I can show you what the, uh, the final footprint looks like and uh, just give you a little bit better picture of that. Uh, but things are moving, and we would, uh, I'd hate to, to name a date, um, about when we'd be in it, uh, but if everything rolls smoothly, if this doesn't uh, hinder us, if the surcharge goes as quickly as we think it will, I think we'd probably be in maybe January, February, something like that. That would be, that would be my thought. So let's just keep praying that way, and uh, we'll trust the Lord will put us in it when he desires to put us in it. Uh, the other prayer request that I want to give besides the building I mentioned this in passing. Uh, it's not a crisis. God, again, in his time will take care of it. But we really are aggressively looking for a staff member. Um, I've, I've interviewed a couple of folks. Um, some I wasn't interested. Uh, some they weren't interested. So we've gone both ways. We've had several we thought might be the, the one, but the Lord just closed the door, which I'm glad that he closes the door until he opens the right one. So we just want you to be aware of it, that we are looking to, uh, to fill that position for an assistant. Um, the money's budgeted. We're ready to, to hire the right person, but we're not going to get in too big a hurry. Uh, but no, we're not going to drag our feet either. We're just looking for different avenues and uh, praying about it. But we want you to pray with us that we'll have real wisdom. And I believe it'd be a great asset to put the right person in that position. And then we, could, we can move forward in a lot a lot. Uh, more efficient way if we've got that filled. So just keep that in prayer if you would. And then tonight, as you turn over to Genesis chapter 39, I'm going to have a word of prayer, and then we will begin right there. Lord, how we thank you tonight for your blessing on us. We thank you for the way you've used our church. We thank you for every soul that we've seen saved, every family that we've seen reached, every Christian who's come and been helped. But Lord, we don't take for granted that it takes your hand, your work, uh, to be a blessing. Lord, we know that except the Lord build the house, we labor in vain that build it. And Lord, one of the uh, most important things that we do, and certainly I don't know of anything more important than we do, is what we do in these next few moments when we open up this book and preach the Word of God. 
Lord, we are dependent upon you even in these moments to teach us, to instruct us, to challenge us, and to get glory to yourself. And we thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis chapter 39 is right in the beginning of the story of Joseph. And probably every uh, young person who has ever been to Sunday school, and certainly many adults who have been in church for any amount of time, are familiar with the story of Joseph. What is interesting about the book of Genesis in 50 chapters is 13 of those chapters are taken up with the story of Joseph. That is, here is a book where God introduces to us the beginnings of everything that he did. His plan is unfolded, and 25% of that book is taken up with the life of this man. Now, we know that Joseph is a great uh, example. He's certainly some very practical lessons, and my desire tonight is to deal with one of the practical sides of this. But you cannot read through these chapters without recognizing that Joseph is a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. The book of, uh, that God has given us, this Bible, is such a remarkable book that God writes for us history in reverse. He gives us the Lord Jesus Christ who has not yet come, who has simply been prophesied. He writes an accurate historical event and lays out for us in this man's life a picture of Jesus. You think about it very briefly, if you would. Jesus is introduced, or Joseph rather, is introduced as the son of his father, who was not the son of his first wife, he was the son of his second wife. You realize the first race that God put on this earth, Adam, failed miserably, and Jesus came, the last Adam, and corrected all the problems of the first. He fulfilled uh, what we did not do when he came to this earth, he is the last Adam. He was rejected by his brethren. Jesus was rejected by his brethren. Uh, he was also reunited with his brethren, which is a prophecy as to what will take place. We could spend an entire message easily going through piece by piece, picture by picture, how Joseph is a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. He goes off, is tested by adversity, goes into Egypt. He takes a Gentile bride. Hey, if you're a believer today and you understand the implication that Jesus took a Gentile bride, hey, we're the recipient of that blessing. We are, as the church, the bride of Christ. But right in the middle of demonstrating this great, tremendous truth of this man Joseph, Though the emphasis was certainly there to tell us about Jesus who would come, what an example this man is because he does picture Jesus. His life is an impeccable type life. Now, no doubt he was a sinner. We don't see all of his errors recorded. We don't see everything that he ever did wrong. But what he paints for us is a man who is placed in the middle of adversity and he comes through that adversity and he does it well. You know, I read the life of Joseph and I realize he had no uh, New Testament. He didn't have the book of Psalms. He didn't have the book of Genesis. He didn't have any of the Bible to be able to read and pick out and say, boy, I'm going through a trial, but let me turn over to the promises of God. What he had basically is what had been told him, a very small amount of God's word, but he rested on that and he made it through when he went through a trial. Now let me tell you, Joseph reminds us that every life, every follower of the Lord Jesus is going to face what Jesus faced, what Joseph faced. You go through this world, you're going to face a trial. You see, just like Jesus who came to this world and he came into his own and his own received him not. Joseph, who pictures the Lord Jesus, was despised by his brethren because he was right. He was despised by his brethren because he was the son who followed the father. He was the son who brought their evil report. He was the son who told the truth, and the world doesn't like it when they hear the truth. Now listen, we're not perfect people. If we know the Lord Jesus today, we're simply forgiven people. We're in Christ. But because we have the truth, if we have to stand for him, if we try to do right, adversity is going to come. Now everybody has uh, adversity. You know, even lost people uh, have adversity. Uh, the life of the transgressor is hard, the Bible says. But their adversity comes for a different reason. Our adversity is because this world is not our home. Right. I mean, we're not supposed to fit into this world. But even in the midst of this world, Jesus said, In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And Joseph gives us that picture. As you go to chapter 39, 
I notice in the middle of this story, we know that Joseph now has been uh, rejected by his brethren. He's been sold to uh, the Ishmaelites. They take him down to Egypt. Potiphar decides that he wants a new slave for his home, and he brings Joseph in. And in verse 1 of chapter 39, Joseph was brought down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. Now that is a bleak picture when we think here is a man who is the son of Jacob, a blessed people that, uh, that God has called Israel, prince with God, and one of his sons now sold by his own brethren into slavery in a strange land. He doesn't even know the language. He's now a slave in Egypt. He is in Potiphar's house. He is in this terrible lot. And yet, verse 2 tells us, And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. Do you know that as a believer... I'm in this world, and I'm going to face tribulation. I'm going to tra face some difficulties. I'm going to face some struggles. Part of the reason we face struggles is this world has problems. I mean, this is a fallen world. We face sickness because sickness is in the world because of sin. Everybody has to face that, unsaved, saved alike. Uh, we're going to face uh, death and, and bereavement because sin is in the world. But some of the things that we face, just like Joseph, come along because God is refining us. He is uh, putting us in the midst of the fire in the sense that the world is around us, the world is against us. But when the tribulation comes, just like Joseph, it doesn't have to take us down because he was still a prosperous man. You know, the Bible reminds us in James chapter 1 and verse 2, it reminds us, it says, Count it all joy, brethren when you fall into divers' temptation. Now, that doesn't say count it all happiness. God's not telling us to get all giddy about it when we're going through a difficulty. He says count it all joy. Joy is on the inside. When you go through the difficulty on the outside, he says, look, go ahead and count it joy. You're not happy about it. Nobody likes bad circumstances. But inside, you think to yourself, God is using this to change me. 1 Peter 1, 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than that of gold which perisheth. See, there is something precious about a trial because in the midst, we can prosper through it. But you know, I noticed not only did he have a, a trial, but look at his testimony in verse 3. The master saw the Lord was with him. And by the way, the Lord can see that. When God is with you, you're allowing him to use you. That doesn't mean they're going to like everything he does, but they're going to recognize that he's with you. This man Potiphar served a heathen god. We don't even find in the life of, uh, of Joseph how much influence he even had for him to know Jehovah God, but he recognized God's hand was on him. And let me tell you something about a church like the church that we're in. You know, our church can go two different ways. We could go to the way of the world and everybody give us a pat on the back and say, we're glad you exist and we're not too worried about it. We can go against the grain of the world in the sense that we stand for the truth. We have a message of the gospel. We're trying to get them to know that they might be able to go to heaven. It might cause a little difficulty. It might cause a little problem. But if God's hand is on us, they'll know it. They'll recognize it. Don't you think God would be pleased if his church would go in his strength and his power, and even though the world might criticize, at least they respect and say, we know God's behind what they're doing. Now, Joseph had that kind of testimony. And you know, we individually can have that kind of testimony. It's only going to happen through God's power. But Joseph was able to do that. You know, the Bible reminds us in 1 Peter 2, 9, it says, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, that you might show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Hey, what an opportunity we have to show people what Jesus has done. Right. And you know, sometimes you can't show it until you go to a trial. Right. You know, Joseph lived with his brethren. If he'd have got along with them, everything had gone smoothly. His brethren had never thrown him in that pit. If his brothers had never got those Ishmaelites and said, look, we want to sell our brother. Look, I can't imagine what Joseph must have been going through. I mean, we find later, when we read the later chapters, and he meet his brother, and you know, they, they call each other over to the side, and they're saying, man, why are we going through all this? They don't know Joseph's still alive. This, this uh, leader of the Egyptians, man, he's being rough with us. Of course, it's Joseph the whole time. He's, we're getting our brother taken away from us. He's sending us back here. I know what it is. 
We heard Joseph's pleas, and we didn't want to let him have his way. You know what that tells me? That tells me Joseph was pleading with his brother, and please don't sell me. Don't do this. I'm your brother. He probably had tears. He couldn't imagine that first night. He spent the night in that nomad's tent as a slave, and he's thinking, man, I'm, my father's got the wealth untold back in Canaan land, and here I am, a slave. Surely somebody's going to come rescue me. Dad will come any day, but Dad didn't come. They took all of those trips, that, that many days across the wilderness, and they get to Egypt. And he's thinking, man, I know any time my dad's going to show up and rescue me from this, but he never did. I mean, it had to be a difficult thing, but in the midst of that difficulty, Joseph said, I'm going to take what I've been given, and I'm going to stand for God here. Hey, we need to take what God is, meets out to us. Not that we say, I'll be glad for God to take it away. I don't find when his brethren came and he was able to reveal himself to his brethren and he was able to get his father to come. I don't ever find him when he got pulled out of jail and was put up in Pharaoh's court and began the, uh, basically the prime minister of Egypt. I don't see him praying and say, God, I learned so much in that trial. Would you put me back in Potiphar's house? I sure would like to go back to prison to get a little more. Listen, you don't have to ask God to give you more. I understand uh, tribulation worketh patience, but if God's got something to teach you, he will. But whatever it is he does give you, let's accept it and go on with it. So he, he has a testimony in the midst. And then, of course, verse 5, it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. You know, this man Potiphar bought Joseph at a slave. Now, in the culture in which he lived, it wasn't necessarily wrong for him to buy the slave from the Ishmaelites. It was obviously wrong to force a man to be a slave, but culturally, uh, that took place all the time. He was simply, it was, he was going through a, uh, a process of what they, they all did. He took the slave, put him in his household, but he was still a heathen. He didn't know God, but because he had bought Joseph, God blessed his house because he was there. Now let me tell you, the world is a much better place today because Jesus came. Now, you'll be a lot better off if you receive him as your savior because you can live with him for all eternity. But if you die and you end up separated from God for all eternity in hell and you look back to the time you were here, you were better on this earth because Jesus came. Now, you'll have an eternity that won't be well because you don't know him. But I'm telling you, the world, what would it be like today where there were, if there were no Jesus? I mean, all we need to do is go back and look at the heathen lands where darkness prevailed, uh, every imaginable evil that took place. There was murder and violence. Look at the, the earth before the flood, and you basically would see what our earth would look like if it wasn't for the Lord Jesus Christ. God blessed Potiphar's house because of Joseph's presence. And this world's a better place because there are believers here. Hey, it's not the believers, it's who's in us. We're believers in Christ and He lives in us, and because He lives in us, the world is a better place. Now, I notice His prosperity in the midst of His trial, but I want you to see also, and you're familiar with the account, but notice His purity in the midst of temptation. I see in verse 7 that it came to pass after these things. Now, you know, when you go through a trial and you come out of that trial on the other side, don't ever think that the devil's done with you. Right. Don't ever think, well, you know, I went through that and that's pretty much about as bad as anybody would have, ever have to face, so pretty much now I can coast. Now, you learn what you went through and say, now when God allows something else to come into my life, I can be a little bit more strong. I can trust him just a little bit greater way. And Joseph was able to do that. Now, it says in verse 7, it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, lie with me. You know, the first thing I noticed is he was targeted. Now, God does try us. In other words, he sends us through some things that will train us and refine us. But we know specifically from the book of James that God never tempts with evil. Now, he cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. He does allow the devil to do things in our life, but I can assure you the devil was behind this temptation. And let me tell you, as a Christian, it's not that we need to have a martyr's complex. 
Please don't get a martyr's complex and say, you know, the only reason that I, uh, nobody likes me at work because I'm a Christian. It might be because you're not a good worker and don't do a good job. You know, the only reason that I can't get along with anybody in my neighborhood. Well, maybe you're a jerk. Don't have a good personality. I mean, don't get a, don't get a martyr's complex just because I'm a Christian. Nobody likes me. On the other hand, know that because you are a Christian and you have a strong testimony, sometimes you will be targeted. Now, it doesn't matter if we're targeted. I mean, God knows all about that. He can certainly protect us. But don't you know that it's not really man that's targeting you. It's your enemy. Right. You know, man's really not the enemy. It, it's not hard for me to look, you know, uh, some of these news stories, and I'll read uh, some of these political stories that take place, and you can almost sometimes uh, read about some of these political liberals, and, and you almost feel like they're the enemy because they stand opposed to everything, it's almost like they have to take a course to know, how can I know and remind myself, anything that God's for, I want to make sure I'm against it. I mean, they just take absolute contrary positions. They're really not the enemy. Let me tell you who the enemy is. The enemy is the devil. He's behind it. He is the God of this present age. And no doubt the devil would have loved to destroy the testimony of Joseph. Here this uh, prosperous man has Joseph. He puts him in charge of everything, and everything seems to be going along fine until Potiphar's wife says, hmm, I think I like Joseph, and she targets him. And no doubt she was a pawn in the devil's hand to try to try him, to put him under temptation. But it wasn't just so much that he uh, was targeted. He's even tracked down. Now, he responded well. You look at verse 8. It says he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master, what if not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all he hath to my hand? There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How can I sin and do this great wickedness against God? Now, the temptation came, and Joseph responded well to the temptation when he was, this, this woman tried to uh, uh, approach him and, and said, look, nobody knows what's going on. My husband's not around. He said, wait a minute. He said, what kind of person would I be? Your husband has put me in a position of power. He doesn't even know what's in my hand. I make decisions in this household. Literally, he was his steward. If he wanted to spend his money, he spent it. If he needed to buy something for the house, he bought it. He literally had given stewardship over to Joseph. And Joseph said, he's given me everything in this house but you. Frankly, he could have got away with it. The bottom line is, if Joseph had just played ball, went along with it, didn't want to cause any stir, who was going to know? His parents certainly didn't. They're gone. Potiphar wasn't going to find out. The wife wasn't going to tell Potiphar. I mean, he could have got away with this. He handled it rightly. And he said, no. He turned it down. You say, well, boy, that handled it. I mean, after he set her straight, she wasn't coming back. I mean, as soon as Joseph said he wasn't interested, she just turned around with a huff and said, I'll never talk to him again. But that's not what happened. No, notice what did happen. She wasn't done. It came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day. I mean, this was ongoing. She made him a challenge. He's a challenge. I'm going to overcome this thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk Joseph into this. And let me tell you, that is a picture of some sins in our life. You know, there are some sins you get confronted with. And perhaps you respond rightly when the temptation comes. I mean, maybe you uh, walk into a store or something. Maybe you did this when you were a young per person. Or maybe some of you young people walk in. Maybe you are confronted with a situation. Uh, boy, I don't have enough money to buy that but I don't believe anybody would ever know the difference. And the thought comes to you, I could just slip that thing in my pocket, walk out, nobody would ever know. But you immediately say, man, that's wrong. My parents have taught me better than that. I probably would get caught. And even if I didn't, God would know about it. And you may never get bothered with that hardly ever. That might not be a struggle to you. But on the other hand, another temptation might come along. Maybe you're just flipping on the television and there's some show there you know that you're not supposed to be watching. Nobody's holding you accountable. And you think, okay, I'm going to turn it off. But the next time, it still wants to pull you. And the next time, it still wants to pull you. Hey, there's some sins that will track you down. Right. Some of them you just brush off and they don't seem to bother you anymore. But we call that a stronghold. You know, there are some strongholds in believers' lives. Right. Some things are more difficult than others. The devil knows your weaknesses. Now, thank God that we have an answer to the stronghold. Amen. It's the Lord Jesus himself. 
2 Corinthians chapter 10, it says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war in the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. God gives us the ability to pull down a stronghold. Joseph was, was, was attacked day by day. He did not hearken. He would not listen. But notice now, you have to, um, to notice this. It says, it came to pass in verse 10, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business. There was none of the men in the house therein. She called him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. He left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. Now, got him out is the translation of a very intricate Hebrew word that meant he took off at high speed, okay? Now, he, he, he looked at the situation, and he didn't try to rationalize he didn't try to say, I'm too strong spiritually for you to put this temptation on me. Hey, don't you know I've uh, been through slavery? I've done this. I was in the, uh, the you know, uh, answered dreams. God communicates with me. I'm above that. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, if any man think he stand, let him take heed lest he fall. Hey, I think what happened, I'll be honest with you, Joseph's no different than anybody else. The thought came to him, you know what? I'm in the house all by myself. This is... This woman has approached me with this temptation, and maybe the thought even came to his mind, could I get away with it? You say, Joseph really thought that? Hey, he's a human being, isn't he? Maybe I could get away with this. And as soon as he did, it scared him to death. And even though she had hold of his clothes, and evidently they didn't have fruit of looms and t-shirts and stuff back in that day, but I mean, she left a garment in his hand, and he fled out with nothing, man, gone. Now, admittedly, it wasn't a great picture. Yeah, he got lied on. Yeah, he uh, ended up getting what appeared to be like trouble, totally innocent. But I'll tell you what, he kept his conscience. And ultimately, by keeping his conscience, he didn't know it at the time, but he's going to end up on top. Now, he was able to respond correctly to temptation. He stood in the midst. And what a day, by the way, in this particular temptation, in this area of temptation, hey, this is some... Oh, 3,000 years old that we're reading here that Joseph lived ago, and things have not changed in our culture. There's plenty of temptations, but that's one of the big ones. 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee fornication. Why did God have to tell us to flee that? Because it is rampant in our culture. It is certainly something the devil knows that can destroy lives, that can hinder our spiritual walk. He answered that temptation, and he answered it right. 2 Timothy 2.22, keep thyself pure, and that's exactly what he did. So he responded to the temptation. So we see his prosperity. We see his purity in the midst of temptation. And then let's just notice quickly his protection. Now, it looked pretty bad for Joseph. I mean, this isn't a great scene. He, she takes his garment. He flees out with nothing on. She lies on him, says, uh, this man tried to come and attack me or whatever, and I, I scared him to death and made him run off. Total lie. Now, at first, it didn't turn out too well, but you'll notice that God protects him. First of all, I notice in verse 14, she called unto the men of her house, spake unto them, saying, He hath brought us into a Hebrew to mock us. He came into me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. Total lie. She was malign. He was maligned. Have you ever been maligned? You ever been lied on? You know, it's, it's one thing to do something wrong and to get caught. But it's something else when you're completely innocent and somebody lies on you. You know, it just seems like most of us at some point uh, experience that. You know, you ex I'll tell you the first time you're going to experience it. If you're an only child, you won't know anything about this. But if you've got siblings, the first person that's going to lie on you is going to be your sibling. Now, I never did lie on mine, but they lied on me <laughs> a bunch of times. I mean, somehow or another... Uh, there, that's where it's going to start. Now, that's just in a household. That's just a small thing. But you know how it feels. Man, I can't believe that. Uh, I didn't do this, and yet I've been blamed for it. But I'll tell you, it, adults do the same thing. Yep. It happens in the workforce. It happens among uh, social circles. People gossip and backbite. And people, in order to try to cover their own wrong, will lie on others. And as a Christian, sometimes you're going to be the brunt of that. Now, God allows that to take place, but even though he allows it to take place, in the midst of it, he protected Joseph. You know, I'm concerned about my testimony, very concerned about it. But if somebody lies on me beyond my control, 
God can protect my testimony. I've just got to leave that to him. Now, not only that, he was mistreated. Look at verse 19. <clears throat> came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, when she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. Now, I read this story, his wrath was kindled, and I wonder who was, was, it, who was it kindled at? I don't believe this man was that ignorant. I think he knew what happened, but now he's in a position, his pride is at stake, and he says, you know, my wife's claiming this happened. It looks pretty bad for Joseph. Um, if the power this man had, he could have had Joseph killed. He didn't have him killed. He just had him put in prison. Now, God, of course, was overseeing this, but I think really when it came down to it, he probably knew Joseph wasn't even guilty. But he had to let him, hey, how am I going to do this? My wife's made me look bad. I'll put him in prison. Now, Joseph could have said, man, here I am innocent. I mean, I can prove this. I, there's no way this happened. But it was beyond his control. We spend a lot of time worrying about stuff that we cannot control. Now, you know they've done a study of this. It's a clinical trial. You'll notice anything they sell, if they've done a clinical trial, that means it works, right? So they've done a clinical trial and found that 100% of worrying changes nothing, ever. Worrying doesn't change one providential event. To take, it doesn't affect it in the least. It's simply you trying somehow or another from something inside by voodoo, the force, whatever it is, to make it change, and it will not change it. It just changes you. Worrying doesn't help a thing. Well, I don't find Joseph really, I don't know that he didn't struggle a little bit, but he didn't seem to worry. And then in verse uh, 21, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. You know, God still does that for me. I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. And this is so applicable in our New Testament that really basically is what Joseph experienced. But turn to 1 Peter Chapter 4, and we're going to end over here. If you notice 1 Peter chapter 4, and the, the theme of 1 Peter is trials. The very opening chapter, the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth. He says in verse 13 of chapter 4, But rejoice, inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. You know why Joseph suffered? He was a picture of Jesus. He suffered for doing right. Jesus, of course, came and was, put, was given over to the Gentiles by his brethren uh, to be crucified. And we are his followers. Jesus said, if the world hated me, they're going to hate you. And he says, rejoice, you're a partaker of the sufferings of Christ. Now, we're part of that. If you be, in verse 14, reproach for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and God resteth upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of. But on your part, he is glorified. You know, the world thinks they have one over on you. They criticize you for your testimony, criticize you for being a Christian, criticize you for standing for the Bible. Or like most of the world, they don't care. They just kind of go along. You're, uh, they just think you're just telling them what they're... You're just, they just think some individual sin they're involved in is all you're concerned about. Men love darkness rather than light. What we believe is much deeper than that. Obviously, we believe that the root's the problem. You're a sinner. You need Jesus to take away your sin, but they don't understand that. They just look, oh, you're not for my homosexual lifestyle. You're not for me telling a dirty joke. You don't like the kind of movies that I like. Whatever it is, they just think it's some individual sin you're worried about. They, they're misunderstanding. On their part, he's evil spoken of. But on your part, he's glorified. You know, honestly, when, when we uh, tell people about Christ, again, don't get a martyr's complex, but you ought to be a little bit enthused or a little bit excited when somebody gets a little bit mad, that means God's working. Amen. You know, I've, I've had people to come into a service many, many times. On the way in, they're smiling. On the way out, they're sulking. But I've seen some of those same sulkers come back a couple of times and get saved. Yeah. I mean, God's working. He's, he's, he's going against the grain of their thinking, and it's not me. What could I do? But the Spirit of God is beginning to touch their heart. Now, on your part, he's evil spoke. On your part, he's glorified. On their part, he's evil spoken of. In verse 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or an evil doer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. In other words, don't suffer because it's your fault. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, 
Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. That is exactly what Joseph did. He didn't suffer because he was a busybody or an evildoer or a murderer, any of that. But in the midst of his suffering, he said, Oh, well, I was a slave. That turned out pretty good because I came steward of Potiphar's house. Now I'm in jail. And he became the steward of the jail. He said, I'm just going to be the best jailbird that I can possibly be. And then he met some people, had a great testimony to the point that one morning he had a dream and he was so bothered by that dream, his testimony was so vibrant that even those old criminals said, Joseph, there's something wrong with you. That's the first time you've ever woke up in the morning, you weren't whistling Amazing Grace or Jesus Saved or something. What's going on? And he, of course, shared his dream. Now, here's Joseph who knew how to respond to adversity. But you know what? I've got a whole lot more information than Joseph had. I've got the blessed Holy Spirit living within me. And you know, I've got a world that needs a testimony just like Joseph's world needed a testimony. May God give us grace to do it. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, how we thank you tonight that you've given us your word. Lord, we are certainly not out searching for difficulty and trial, but when they come, we know in this world we'll have those tribulations, but Lord, may we remember you've overcome the world. Help us to stand with the right kind of testimony. Help us to have victory over the temptation that comes. And may we constantly look to you for help, for grace, for strength. We pray that you'd give us open doors through it, that we might be the witness we ought to be. Lead us tonight now in this invitation time. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand tonight. We're going to sing 546, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. As we sing that invitation song tonight, if there's a need, if you need to find a place of prayer, I'd invite you to come. If you're here without Christ, we'd love to take a Bible and show you how to be saved tonight in this service. If God's spoken, you come as we sing. Dismiss in prayer. I've enjoyed being with you today. I hope you'll find opportunity to fellowship and following our service. I'm going to ask Mr. John Brewer if he'll close us.